Good day and welcome to part two of our roundtable discussion. I'm Suki Lee, Vice President of Human Resources for ADP Canada. I certainly don't want to date uh, any of us, but I think it's fair to say that we've all started our careers in the 20th century. And I think we would all agree that it is a much different world now than it was when we started out. So I'm interested in what business leaders like all of you think is different about the 21st century workforce and what it is that we should be thinking about today that we haven't in the past. So maybe Nora, I know you've been um, doing a lot of research into multi generational workforces and certainly the shift from employer employee more to organization and individual so how does this impact how we view talent today well, I think the first thing to recognize is that talent is really we're talking about people we're talking about individuals and we are talking about multi-generational multicultural workforces we're also talking about workplaces that are significantly um, dynamic and agile and the speed at which we're changing is extraordinary and I think when we're looking at the employ traditional employer-employee relationship, the employer just had to provide employment and that was fine. And now as we've been talking about, it's more the responsibility of the organization to provide employability in the future. And when we think about that, then the relationship is shifting from an employer-employee one to an organization individual one. And that individual has skills, talents, um, expertise, experiences, dreams, goals, and aspirations that they bring to the workplace. And I think when we look at the complexity of the workplace, the multi-generational one, the multicultural one, the increasingly diverse one, then it, it means that the organizations that are going to be most successful are the ones that create that opportunity for customization, customization of everything from compensation packages, career paths, development tracks, and those are the ones that are going to be succeeding in the future. Okay. Mark, um, this summer you were blogging about the need for HR leaders uh, to lead the way in new forms of working uh, to help the business deliver on its strategies. So um, you, you speak about increasingly having virtual teams, contractors, freelancers, uh, working together maybe on a project and then actually breaking apart and reforming in a different group to work on another project. So how is it um, that we should be managing talent in this kind of environment? I think it presents some real challenges for us. So I think, as, as you say in the summer, some of the blogs I've written, it's really challenging the HR profession to, to step into that space and, and take a real leadership role in terms of how can we ensure that our organizations are really effective in uh, dealing with a diverse workforce, as, as Nora outlines. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity that it provides for us to, to really think about all of the HR policies, all of the HR practices, and make sure that they are relevant to the organization and relevant to, to what will be people coming from all sorts of different uh, perspectives and different backgrounds. So they could be contractors, they could be consultants. I remember reading another blog from somebody who talked about the employee experience being, being a beautiful employee experience, which you don't hear that word used very often, but for contractors and for employees. So a lot of it is quite philosophical in terms of what is your approach around how you're going to deal with people and ensuring that you're dealing with them in a very consistent way, but taking into account their own individual circumstances and, and dealing with that proactively, making sure you understand that and putting in place the right practices that are really going to ensure that those people regardless of, of the relationship you have with them, that they want to come back and do their best possible work with your organization. Now, Les, um, I'm going to um, talk to you about a topic that has been garnering a lot of headlines recently. Um, you've worked in uh, many different industries where performance reviews and the annual performance feedback process um, has been a long-standing tool. Um, many companies today are eliminating that um, and focusing on continuous feedback instead. How does this impact how we um, should be measuring the workforce or how we can measure the workforce? There's no question that performance reviews have had a, a bad rap for a long time, both within HR because we had, we're the, one, the keepers of the system and it requires a lot of work. Uh, along with line managers who just hated doing this, either mid-year reviews and then the, then, uh, the final review at the end of the year. Um, so this continuous feedback concept 
is resonating maybe for the wrong reasons because it's an avoiding, or it's getting rid of throwing out one system and coming in with something that's very unstructured, requires a lot of skills on, on behalf of the managers providing that feedback. In fact, I'd say in many ways, the manager almost has to be a behavioral science expert because how much, how, how much feedback, what's the per percentage of positive feedback versus constructive feedback? Um, so, it, uh, you know, the, the concept has merit. It requires a lot of execution and training and the reward system for managers to encourage them to continuously give feedback. But whatever the system is that we ultimately end up with, it, there are three things that we need to, I think, that we have to measure talent on. One, the goals and objectives that we set for them. Why are they there? You know, what pucks are they putting in the net? Two, if they're in a leadership role, how effective are they in lead, leading people? And three, piggybacking on Samantha, how good are they as a, play, as a team player mm -hmm. if they're, in, in many organizations, are, are, are multifunctional in nature and, uh, and therefore they have to operate as a team player. They're not all leaders. So whatever the system is, those three things have to be measured and, um, and, I, and I hope we'll, we'll get better at it. Um, but we shouldn't totally throw the baby out with the bathwater on this uh, performance review issue. Les, can I just ask you a question about that? Because it seems like one good transitional step is, I've been at a number of companies and worked with a number of managers where, where they will say, if an employee gets a bad performance review and is surprised at the end of the year, you failed as a manager. So even if there's not an official structured system of constant communication, constant feedback. It feels like maybe baby steps for the organizations that are still retaining the annual performance review is you should not be delivering surprises. It's hard to conceive if, if you've got a, you know, a, a leader of, of uh, employees where performance is measured, et cetera. It's hard to conceive of with, you know, after a 12-month period that, that the person would be surprised by their performance. Especially nowadays, where we've got 360s in place, we've got self-evaluations. I th actually, I think the self-evaluation was one of the better add-ons to the performance review process because it took away the surprise to the manager. Because, and, and, and it's not at the end of the year that you should be doing self-evaluations. It's more periodic. A lot of companies have mid-year reviews. At least that's six months into the process you're checking the scoreboard, but there shouldn't be lots of there shouldn't be surprises at the end of the of that, whatever the system is. But typically, those performance reviews measure achievements and accomplishments. Mm -hmm. When today's employee and the individuals are equally interested in understanding what contribution they're making, which is above and beyond, it's the personality that they bring, it's the spirit that they bring, it's their the whole human being that they bring to the workplace. And traditional performance reviews or systems tend to ignore that side of the individual. And I think just focusing on achievements and accomplishments, we lose out on really helping people become the whole person that they want to become in the workplace. And it's where a lot of individuals make decisions about leaving or disengaging um, in the process. But I, I think, though, that the more sophisticated performance review processes actually have a balance. They review what are, what's expected of, of that role or to function, and also how, how you operate it, which gets more into what Nora talks about in terms of <clears throat> how effective were you as a leader, mm -hmm. how could you become better as a leader, you know, how are you developing talent. So it's more holistic than just did you put the puck in the net or not. And we've had some success at that RSA, having that balance between the what and the, the how. But with your behavioral science um, point, Les, I agree with you. That's needed a lot of education and support. And, and to be honest, I think we've still got some way to go to really ensure we are focusing on the how to the same, same extent as we are the what. But that certainly has to be the aspiration. I think the nugget for me is when uh, people often talk about eliminating performance reviews or the annual process, they focus on just 
the pieces of work that they're taking out. And ultimately, what I hear from all of you is it is just as much actually requiring a different kind of investment uh, in the organization. So it's not as simple as let me just eliminate one piece, but rather you're you're filling in other gaps that you might have organizationally in terms of managing talent and just doing it a different way. Um, Ken, let me come to you. So you've come from a financial background, and I know CFOs are pretty focused on getting to the uh, return on investment for talent. So if we eliminate things like performance ratings, how should we be measuring our workforce? Shoot, I was hoping you guys would tell me. <laughs> So it, that is by far the hardest question. And you know, I, I worked with a wise man who loved to pound the table and say, you get what you measure. Um, and it's great to try and work to that dictum, but sometimes you have to admit you can't directly measure. So what can you measure? Well, clearly you can measure outcomes and output. So the what, um, were objectives met, were the deliverables delivered, how do we do on our sales, on our efficiency, on our coding development programs. Uh, I think you also need to be very in tune with the staff, what's the word for it, you know, morale, do you have high turnover, are people complaining or grumbling even if it's unofficial coming up through the ranks. So I think there is, it's not going to be a nice neat system that I can give a, a percentage ROI and put in the books. But there are certainly ways that you can measure, are we doing what we set out to do and what we've, we're paying these people to do? And do we feel like we're doing a decent job based on what we're seeing of promotions in-house, of turnover, both good and bad, of morale? Is that working? Mm -hmm. Not going to come down to a nice, neat number in the books, though. Now, in this environment of change, Samantha, I'm going to ask you a question, because you and I have spoken earlier about the importance of uh, not just resilience, but um, the skill set around being agile uh, and agility um, as being critical. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. We're being uh, asked more and more to, uh, to come in and work with organizations to develop more agility uh, within the organization, because we all know that organizations in today's highly competitive world uh, have to be uh, agile as an organization. Well, the workforce within the organization has to be agile, too. Uh, it used to be, um, if I think back to the 20th century, used to be that people largely did about the same thing and then every once in a while they would have some change to, to deal with. And we looked at, at skills like resilience or adaptability as kind of the key skills at that time. But um, if you think about it as a continuum, today's world, it's constant change. Um, we have to move from, from boss to boss, project to project, meeting to meeting, situation to situation, job to job. And uh, we need a higher uh, level of skill to, to be able to do that, something that uh, is more akin to agility, where we can uh, swiftly and surely move from situation to situation. And, and we believe it is a, it is a skill. Uh, it is something that you can develop more of. Uh, and it's, uh, some of the foundations of that skill would be things like uh, flexibility, open mind, um, uh, speed of learning, you know, a quick learner, resourcefulness, creativity, those types of things. Now, Nora, I know you've got some thoughts on this topic as well. Anything to add to that? I think what we need in order for organizations to be agile is individuals to be nimble. And in order for individuals to be nimble, we need to create a culture of customization. And if you think eliminating um, performance reviews makes managers antsy, talking about total customization of the employee experience um, makes them absolutely crazy. What we're seeing is Organizations that create a culture of customization, recognizing the diversity, recognizing the individual interests, recognizing the whole human being are the ones that are increasingly successful. And think about it almost like coffee. Um, human resource professionals and practitioners in the past could offer black coffee in a mug and everybody's needs were met and everybody was satisfied and everybody was happy. Then along comes the 80s and 90s and we start getting more diversity in the workplaces and HR started to go beyond uh, payroll and benefits and into much more holistic and we had more choices and more alternatives. So it was more like having a coffee bar where you had regular decaf coffee with cream and milk or sugar and sweetener and, and people had choices but you still were limited. 
now we're creating workplaces that are more like the tall vanilla latte, double hot, double shot, no foam soy, and every cup is different. Keeping in mind that the core is still the same. It's still coffee, there's still a dairy product, there's still a sweetener, but it's the way in which we put it together mm -hmm. that is significantly different. And I think in this day and age, the managers and the, the HR professionals and practitioners or owners, operators in small businesses that embrace this concept of customization are the ones that are gonna be ultimately successful in the short and in particular the long term. What a terrific analogy. I just wish I'd invested in Starbucks a lot earlier. <laughs> this is the end of our second chapter. Please be sure to watch the rest of this roundtable discussion.